single believer has a ministry. Every single child of God has a ministry. Whether you're black or white or blue, whether you're young or old, you have a ministry. But because of my time, I will not go into what that ministry is. But the purpose of this conference is so that the saints can be perfected. Now that word perfecting, don't get it twisted, right? I love to study the Greek once in a while. A lot of times I've done it. In the Greek word, katastinos. It means a complete furnishing. It's K-A-T-A-R-T-I-S-N-O-S. It means a complete furnishing. A complete furnishing means that this is supposed to be the us. We're supposed to be armed with the knowledge of God's word and the knowledge of God's spirit. And once we, are, once we receive that equipping, it's for no other thing than the work of the ministry. So it is not just Reverend Bayo Oyeko or Pastor Tolu or Dr. Olala or Pastor Fumi or any other pastor or minister that you know is in the ministry. Actually, the work of the fivefold is to perfect the saints. That is why the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, they have a different kind of anointing. That anointing is an equipping for them to be able to equip the saints. Because if, if you check your English dictionary, to furnish means to supply something or provide somebody with something. So a complete provision of what we need for the work of the ministry. Glory to God. A complete provision. So this evening, with your heart ready to receive, Realize that instruction are going to come unto you. Prophecies, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues to instruct us concerning the things that we need to do. For those of us that have fallen asleep, remember Ephesians that we look at on Sunday. Awake, thou that sleepest. And, 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 and Christ will give you light. That means that some people were sleeping. So if you're sleeping, we'll be awoken. Amen. But there will be a complete furnishing tonight. There will be an equipping for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, which will bring about the final body of Christ. Now we're going to do something quickly this evening, as I always like to do in Bible study. You know, when the Bible was written, they did not have commas. There were no commas, there were no full stops. Of course, um, King James, of the best man, we did a good job of receiving translating. The Bible. But if we remove all the both commas there and we read them through, it looks like just one clear blank statement. Amen. Can we do that together? Want to go for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the refining of the body of Christ. So it sounds like the saints are being perfected of the ministry. And by the time we start doing the work of the ministry, you know the word edifying means a building up. Glory to God. I don't want to go to session two of day two tomorrow. So we stay here this evening. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. So I need you to open your hearts this evening. And I remember I told us that what do we need to come? What do we need to bring to this conference? Your Bible and your jota. So if you are there listening live, wherever you are in the world, make sure you have your Bible and your jota with you. Because instructions will come. Write down, receive clarity. You know, my, 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 my pastor's wife, Pastor Bosa de Ogulano, will always say that the faintest ink is better than the sharpest memory. Because it is easy to forget some things. Remember, it is a conference. It is a spiritual, academic encounter. Because we are going to look into God's word. Quite a number of us have been under Pastor Bayo's ministry before. So you understand what I'm talking about. We are going to listen to God's word well taught. Amen. Praise God. So are you ready tonight? Can you just lift your hands? Just, just where you are, just lift your hands and give him praise once again. Just thank him. Just thank him. You know we are the circumcision that worship the Father in the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ and we have no confidence in the flesh. We, we, we are the circumcision. We worship the Father in the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ and we have no confidence in the flesh. Just lift your hands. Father, we thank you tonight. We receive that which you have for us. We receive that which you have for us in all its fullness. In all its fullness, our hearts are hungry. We are hungry for your word. 
we want to be thoroughly furnished because we know that we have received that ministry of reconciliation and that word we want this evening and we trust you father we will experience your word in all its clarity it will be taught in all clarity your spirit will be demonstrated we will be edified and jesus will be glorified come on lift your hands and thank him we thank you father we thank you father we thank you father we thank you lord 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 we give you praise and glory we worship you we bless your name just quietly on your seat there just lift your hands oh we thank you lord mm -hmm. Oh yes, Lord, we worship you. We thank you. We give you tonight to receive your word thank you because we have clarity and understanding and uh, revelation of the truth of christ in our hearts your name is exalted your name be praised forever we thank you precious father in jesus precious name we worship amen hallelujah hallelujah glory to god it's a joy to be here again this year hallelujah I remember the experiences of last year and the flow of God's spirit and the blessings received and the light of the truth of God's word that came to every one of us. Uh, I want to appreciate the servants of God tonight. Let me appreciate our pastors. Um, I'm not doing that out of just a sense of obligation. I'm doing that because it is scriptural, it is proper that where you see uh, those set over a local assembly giving opportunity to somebody else to come in is a sign of trust. It's a sign of trust to hand over that which God has committed to you for others to come in and fit the flock. It's a sign of trust. Not only that, where you also have the opportunity like this on a ministry like this to be open to the truth of God's word in the days we're in, particularly in this decade where God is opening the truth of his word to many people we ought to appreciate our pastors tremendous. Can we appreciate our pastors one more time? God bless you, sir. God bless you, man. Thank you for the honor and the privilege. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So we're going to look at God's word tonight. And um, 
I'm going to say one or two things to start off. I want you to write as much as possible because it's a teaching conference. It's the word and the spirit. It's the word and the spirit. And the reason is because the reason why the word is extremely important to emphasize, like Pastor said earlier, is that without a foundation of the word, you will not be able to hold on to what you have by the spirit. It's extremely important. So sometimes we are so focused on the spirit <laughs> that we shift our attention from the word. But it's the word of God that gives you the foundation to lay hold of things of the spirit. In fact, the word of God is a statement of unseen realities. The word of God, particularly the epistles, are statements of unseen realities. That's very important for us to understand. They are statements of unseen realities. The epistles in particular carries instructions that are a revelation to every believer of what you have, who you are, what you can do. So when we go through the scriptures, one of the things we celebrate on this side of the cross, when I say this side of the cross, I'm talking about after the resurrection of Jesus, is that some things are called yes and amen. That means they are your reality now. Now, if you look at yourself in the physical, in the natural, you may not see any sign that those things are your reality. That's why we have God's word as a map of the spirit realm to guide us, let us know the realities that belong to us that we can walk in today. So without the word of God, there are many realities that belong to us that we may not enjoy. And God wants us to enjoy those things. So the teaching of God's word is how God gives you an understanding of the realities that belong to you in Christ Jesus. Say amen. amen. That's important. Ephesians chapter 1. We're just going to start. So I've been, asked to, I've been asked to look at the topic of the spirit within, which is really quite a wide subject. <laughs> because that, that's like the foundation of our salvation. So, But we're going to just start out and then we trust God as we go on. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Now, because it's a conference, let me also give you my own personal ground rule. If I'm speaking too fast, do like this. It's not rude. Are we in agreement? It's not rude. Just do like this. I will calm down. Let me tell you why. This thing is intoxicating. How many of you have taken alcohol before? This thing. Hmm? If you ingest this thing, you can't be normal. You understand? This is the mind of Christ put in ink, but it's not ink. This is the spirit of the living God. Do you understand? So it's intoxicating. So if a minister regularly fellowships with this, even when he's teaching, he would think he's alone. Because you get carried away. Hmm? So I have a tendency to get carried away. Do you understand? So just do like this. Now calm down. I'll take it again. Is that okay? Are we in agreement? Okay, good. So if you just want... Glory to God. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who art blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You notice the word places is italicized? So it actually says in the heavenlies in Christ. In the heavenlies in Christ. The word heavenlies means in the unseen realm in Christ. It says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father are not two different titles. They are the same. He says, I'm explaining who God is to you now. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the word hand is an explanation of the word God. Blessed be the God that is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What has he done? He has blessed us. With what? All. Say all. Say all. Say all authority. All power. All ability that belongs to the Godhead. Belongs to me now. Is my present tense. Inheritance now. Now, from verse 4 all the way down to verse 13 is an explanation of what those spiritual blessings are. He's not allowing you to guess what those blessings are. He gives you an outline of what they are. Okay, for instance, verse 4 speaks about the fact that according to he has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world, that you should be holy and without blame before him in love, he has predestinated you unto what? adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glorious grace wherein he has made us accepted where in the beloved so if you read down further down further down he's simply outlining what those blessings are so before you get to cars and houses he's telling you it's spiritual blessing in the unseen realm 
It means that God is particular in salvation about your status and standing that actually influences how you pray, how you think, how you speak. That's what spiritual blessings are for. Anybody can have material natural blessings. You don't have to be a believer to have natural blessings. You don't have to be. But that which separates us from those who are not in Christ is those spiritual blessings, this acceptance, this love. He has abandoned towards us in all wisdom and prudence. He says in him we have redemption, that is the forgiveness of sins. So a believer's present status, state, ongoing state, is that you are eternally forgiven. Say, I'm eternally forgiven in Christ Jesus. So he outlines it. Then in verse 16, he now says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and what? Revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, in case you missed it, I said from verse 4 all the way down, he outlines what the blessings are. Then he says something in verse 13 that's important. He says, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with what? That Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our what? Inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of, the glo of his glory. Now that's a mouthful. But what is he saying? What is he saying? Because this, you were sealed. The word sealed simply means to put a mark of approval on a finished product. The same way you are wearing, some of us wear designer outfits, and we have logos on the outfits, isn't it? And so the logo calls your attention to whoever made the fabric, isn't it? So he says you were sealed. So you be a God's logo. That's important. It means, that's important. It means God put a stamp of approval, and that stamp is his spirit, because we're going to be talking about the spirit this, this evening and throughout this conference. And we need to understand the importance, because one of the greatest challenges we have as believers is that we have a low appreciation for the blessings that we have. So the word of God is meant to call our attention to awaken in us a fresh appreciation for what we already have. A believer is not somebody looking for something. It's somebody who ought to appreciate to a degree, degree what he already has. So there are things you have. That's why nowhere in the New Testament are you taught what you don't have. The emphasis is what you have and how to walk in what you have. That's the emphasis of the epistles. So it says you are sealed. It means you carry God's logo. It means you bear God's imprint. God's personal imprint. So God's personal imprint on a believer is his spirit. That's important. It's a spirit. So if you understand that, verse 16 and 17 will not make sense because in verse 17, it speaks about praying. And the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, will give unto you the spirit of wisdom. Is it talking about the other spirit? No. You already are sealed with the spirit. Is another way of saying that verse is this, that it will give unto you spiritual wisdom and what revelation in the knowledge of him. That's a better translation. Spiritual wisdom and what? Revelation in the knowledge of him. It now says that the eyes of your understanding being what? Enlightened that you may know. I'm sure, as my custom is, I must have said some things about this last year also. I, will, I deliberately just stopped there, that you may know. So a finished product in Christ, the one who bears the imprint of God, has to know. Knowing is God's greatest benefit to you after salvation. You need to know. You need to have an appreciation for spiritual realities. Now, that appreciation doesn't give you spiritual realities. That appreciation awakens spiritual realities. Let me say it better. That appreciation awakens you to spiritual realities. So what are we going to do throughout this conference? We want to awaken you to spiritual realities. So as the word of God has been taught, once understanding dawns on you, you are waking to what? Spiritual realities. And once, whatever you are waking to, you are able to walk in. That's very important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Paul's prayer for a believer. Notice this, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention. Why is Paul giving thanks? A believer is not the prayer point, it's a source of thanksgiving. See, I'm not a prayer point. I'm a source of thanksgiving. As long as I keep my attention on the blessings that I've received in Christ Jesus, I lack nothing. I have all things. All I need is in me by God's spirit 
even now. Hallelujah. I can't be confused. I can't be stranded. I can never be without. Abundance belongs to me. Clarity belongs to me. Understanding belongs to me. I walk in the power of God. I walk in divine provisions. The ability of God is mightily expressed through me to other men. Hallelujah. Now, notice what happened. If you are paying attention, what happened to you when you were saying those things? Something on your inside will bear witness. Hallelujah. Something on your inside will bear witness. Why? Paul says, we cease not to give thanks for you. Making mention of you in, which is, when I'm praying for you, the bulk of my prayer for you is thanksgiving. Paul is saying, I'm not saying you don't have faults. I'm not saying you don't have weaknesses. But rather than focus on the faults and weaknesses, I keep my attention on how God has blessed you. That's what Paul is saying. Why do we end up complaining and murmuring? Because we don't keep our attention on those things. So Paul is saying, I'm praying that God will give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, not you. Him. Revelation of him is understanding of you. Revelation of him is the understanding of you. A believer does not study himself to know himself. That's metaphysics. A believer studies Christ to know himself. Hallelujah. A believer studies who? Christ to know himself. So the knowledge of him is the understanding of you. That's what it means. That the highest of your understanding being flooded with light, you may know what is the supernatural expectation behind this calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. Say, I'm that saint. I'm that saint that carries the riches of God's inheritance within me today. Hallelujah. That's so important. That's who we are. Hallelujah. Sorry, the way I teach, I need you to participate. So I'll be doing that a lot because it will awaken you faster. And maybe tomorrow if we get to that point in time, I will show you how the words of your lips declaring the realities that belong to you will awaken spiritual faculties on your inside. When you're talking about the spirit upon, it will awaken. There is something, the response of faith, whatever you require is not coming outside, it's coming out of you. It's going to come out of you. Even at your dullest moment, your weakest moment, the resources of God dwell in you abundantly. The clarity you need, the leading you need, the provision you need, the answer will come from within. Because the celebration of the epistles is Christ in you is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Not Christ outside of you, that's the Old Testament. Christ in you is what? The hope of glory. Hallelujah. So, now, go with me this, where you're starting, that was introduction. Amen. Ezekiel 36. Glory to God. Ezekiel 36. How many of you knew Jesus was a prophet? How many of you knew Jesus was a prophet? Thank you. At least you agree. Okay. So what we have as the epistles are the explanation of the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures are the Old Testament texts. So all they had in the days of Paul were Ma Genesis to Malachi. And then the revelation or the explanation of Genesis to Malachi is what we have as the epistles. So all the things that Jesus said and taught, he took it from where? From Genesis to where? Malachi. So everything you find written in the epistles is an explanation. It's written in Genesis to Malachi as a mystery. It is written in clarity and plain language in the epistles. So if you go to Ezekiel 36, for instance, again for i will take you from among the eden and gather you out of all countries i will bring you into your own land 25 then will i sprinkle clean water upon you you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will i cleanse you now we're looking at how does god speak when he's speaking of the realities that we now know in christ notice how he speaks in verse 25 it says then will i sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will i cleanse you if he will sprinkle clean water, whatever he calls clean water is strong and potent enough to separate you from idols. Hallelujah. How many of you know idols are spiritual entities? How many of you agree? Idols are spiritual entities. So notice the language. It says, I will sprinkle. So it's talking about the activity of God in man. This is God's doing. He says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Idols is anything else that takes the trust and the attention of men away from God. 
So he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water and will I cleanse you? Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. If you don't understand what he's saying in verse 25, you will miss verse 26. In verse 25, he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water and the water will ensure you are clean. What will you be cleansed from? From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Verse 26, a new heart also, or in like manner, will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. So the sprinkling and the giving of the water in verse 25, in verse 26, it now calls a new heart. Hallelujah. Are you following tonight? So whatever has happened in verse 24, 25, is now called a new heart in verse 26. It says, also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away. Can you see that? The stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. So a new heart in verse 26, which is clean water in verse 25, is now my spirit within you in verse 27. Are you following? Hallelujah. Can you see that? So the water that I will give you will cleanse you and separate you from idols. In verse 26, it is a new heart that I will give you, a new spirit which I will put where? Within you. The putting of that new spirit within you will automatically take out of your heart the whole stony heart of flesh. In verse 27, that says, and I will put my spirit, say my spirit, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them the phrase cause you to walk in my statutes is not a present tense ongoing activity is something that is done once in other words the key to walking in my statutes and keeping my judgments is a new heart that new heart is the water that i sprinkled upon you that cleansed you that which cleansed you is my spirit hallelujah can you see that? So the water that I will give you will cleanse you and separate you from idols. In verse 26, it is a new heart that I will give you, a new spirit which I will put where? Within you. The putting of that new spirit within you will automatically take out of your heart the whole stony heart of flesh. In verse 27, that says, and I will put my spirit, say my spirit, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them the phrase cause you to walk in my statutes is not a present tense ongoing activity is something that is done once in other words the key to walking in my statutes and keeping my judgments is a new heart that new heart is the water that i sprinkled upon you that cleansed you that which cleansed you is my spirit within you that you follow it tonight i'm trying to be slow Okay, so the water is a spirit. The spirit is a cleanser and the cleansing. The cleansing is an ability to walk in the light of God's will. And it's talking about a new birth here. So when Jesus speaks up this teaching in the Gospels, look at how Jesus says it. Just Gospel chapter 4. John's Gospel chapter 4. Verse 7. John's Gospel chapter 4 verse 7. There come the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou willest have asked of him, and he will have given thee what? Living water. Now, Jesus is about to teach what Ezekiel prophesied. So, Ezekiel's clean water is Jesus' living water. Are you following? Ezekiel's clean water is Jesus' living water. Jesus now says living water. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that says to you, give me to drink? So, Jesus' invitation to the woman, give me water to drink, is not an invitation to take from the woman, it's an invitation to give to the woman. It's to get the woman's attention. Then Jesus begins to explain, in case you think I'm talking about natural water. And one of the things we need to realize in the Gospels, in the teachings of Jesus, that confused many individuals who were with him, particularly the disciples and those who were his audience, is the fact that God has his nomenclature for things. The man has his nomenclature for things. Now, we say often that when God says living water, God is using figure of speech, but God does not use figure of speech. It is man that uses figure of speech. For instance, in John chapter 6, gospel, when Jesus began to speak about giving his life to the world for salvation, he called their attention to the manner that Moses gave them. 
He says, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven. For your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are now dead. But my father giveth you the true bread from heaven, which a man may eat and never die. In other words, the figure of speech is the manna. The life of Jesus is the real. Are you following? So the water in the well for this woman is a figure of speech. The water Jesus gives is the real water. God's real water is his spirit. God's bread is the life of Christ. Are you following? So see what he says again. Good evening, sir. God bless you, sir. God's servant just entered. Let me appreciate Apostle Leah Ali tonight. Such an honor. So he says, uh, if thou knowest the gift of God, who is it that said unto you, give me to drink? That will as I have asked of him, and he will have given you living water. Of course, the woman was perplexed. And the woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Whence hast thou this living water? Are you greater than our father, uh, Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself? And the stranger is cattle. Jesus answered and said unto him, Whosoever drinks of this water shall what? Thirst again. So he's calling attention. What do I mean by living water? I'm referring to Ezekiel's water that cleanses. The water that cleanses is God's spirit. God's spirit is the new heart within you. That is the new birth. Are you following? So look at verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall test again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give shall never test. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a supernatural deposit. It shall be in him a well of water springing up to what? Life everlasting. Who was he talking about? The new birth. The spirit dwelling inside of you and I. Hallelujah. Are you following? So John's Gospel chapter 7. I'm really taking my time with scriptures because it's meant to be a teaching. <laughs> Chapter 7, glory to God. Jesus taught consecutively. Now, one of the ways you understand the teaching of the gospel is, is that when you read without chapters, you notice that one thought flows into another. So he has already told Nicodemus in chapter 3, except a man be born from above, of water and of the spirit. And what that scripture actually says is that water, that is the spirit. And when I speak of water, I'm talking about the spirit. Do you understand? So here now, he's about to explain further what he said in chapter 4 to the woman. The water that I will give. So there's water in this well, but there's another water I will give. Anyone who takes this natural water will test again, but there's a water that I will give that a man will receive and never test because the water will be in him. A well of water that will what? spring up to a what? everlasting life. Now pay attention to that because if it's a well of water, if I give you to drink of this water, this water becomes a well within you or a source of life within you. If it's a source of life within you, it means it will be able to feed and nourish others also. How many of you agree with that? Good. Chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man test, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. Can you see that? So he's talking about the same thing using a different phrase. If any man says, let him come unto me and drink. I am the one that carries the water or I am the river carrier. I am the water giver. I am the one that sprinkles your heart until it is clean. I am the one that gives a new heart within you by giving you my spirit. So the giving of the spirit is a recreation of man. That's what Jesus is saying. He says in verse 88, He that believed on me, how do you come to Jesus? If any man does let him come, you come by believing. You come by believing. If any man does let him come unto me, how do you come? You come by believing. He says, He that believed on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this speak he of the spirit. Can you see that? So Jesus is teaching about what? The giving of the spirit. The giving of the spirit, which is the new birth. That which you receive as salvation. Which Ezekiel calls a new heart. The giving of the spirit. That's what he's saying. But this picky of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. They that believe on him should receive. Now look at the phrasing. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. If you're using a good King James, the one given is italicized. So the Holy Ghost was not yet. <laughs> or the new nature is not yet. The new art is not yet. Are you following? It's not yet. It's not available yet. Why wasn't it available? Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the glorification of Jesus is what signals you receiving the water, you receiving the cleansing, 
you receiving the new heart you receiving a new nature within you hallelujah so he says look at that verse 38 again it says he that believeth on me do you believe on him do you believe on him he that believeth on me as the scripture has said out of his belly that is is there is jesus out of jesus belly shall flow rivers of living water but he spoke of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet what glorified but there's something about that glorification you need to see it says the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified so the giving of the spirit is the glorification of jesus that's what it means hallelujah glory to god look at john's gospel chapter 14. are you getting something tonight let's lay the foundation properly glory to god uh verse 2 and then we're going to jump we're going to do some verse and we're going to jump are you there uh in my father's house there are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and i think we looked at this text last year did we look at it last year okay good so, so if i go and prepare a place i go to prepare a place means i will go by way of the cross i will be crucified and i will bury for three days and i thought i will rise though no, verse 3 says if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again so what is coming again the resurrection after i rise from the dead i will what come again what will i do when i come i will receive you unto myself that where i am there you may be also jump with me all the way to verse verse 16 glory to god and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Notice that. Every time you say the word forever, in the light of which Jesus uses here, he's talking about that which will match with your nature. Forever simply means it becomes part of you. It becomes part of your being. He's talking about the new birth. I will pray the Father. The word pray there means I will ask of the Father. When I rise from the dead, I'm at the Father's right hand. I will ask for the Father. He will give you another comforter that he may. So the manner of asking, what he's asking for is forever. Pay attention. So a believer has the spirit of God forever. Without the spirit of God, you can't be called a believer, a son of God. So he's saying your nature is changed when you have the spirit. Say, I have the spirit. Say, I have the spirit. You see what Jesus is teaching here. He is not talking about having the spirit where you see one physical sign or one sound. No. He's talking about the nature that the believer has. One leads to the other. Without understanding that you have the spirit, we can't talk about the spirit upon or the activity and the demonstration of the spirit so the reason why many don't work in demonstration because they are not even convinced about the fact that they have the spirit having the spirit that is the indwelling is what leads to the outpouring it's a fountain welling up you won't know it's welling up until i act on it when i act on it that which was on my inside wells up to bless you it's called the outpouring or the spirit upon say amen so the spirit within precedes the spirit upon it's just explanation they are not two different experiences they are two different expressions one experience two different expressions one speaks about your nature the other speaks about the activity of your nature are you getting something so there is the indwelling that leads to the outpouring we have the activity of the spirit because we have the indwelling of the spirit and jesus says it shall be with you for how long for so in your weakest moment all you need to know is that the spirit of god indwells you and indwells you forever so you are never without the spirit that's why hebrews 13 from verse 5 says that let your conversation be free of covetousness and be content with such as you have for he has said i will never leave you no one forsake you that's not a different experience from the indwelling that's the explanation of the indwelling are you following that's not a different experience. That's the explanation i will never leave you nor forsake you is the spirit dwelling in you if he's dwelling in you he can't leave nor forsake you so he's calling your attention he says i'm in you as a helper i will never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say the lord is my one helper so when does the help that is in you by the indwelling manifest when you say the lord is my helper is he your helper whether you say it or not so you're saying it simply brings who he is into expression we call that the outpouring of the spirit upon 
Are you following? So we have the spirit. I will never leave you nor forsake you is the indwelling. You may boldly say, Lord, my helper is the spirit of God. It's a spiritual expression. So it's just an explanation of the same thing. Glory to God. I will pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may. So the comfort that you receive, the new birth, the indwelling of the spirit, it is that he may abide with you forever. Abide with you forever. Don't take your mind out of the text. Don't start thinking like an Englishman. Think within the context. He has just told you in verse 3, in my father's house there are many mansions. In my father's household, there's room for many other sons. He has just told them in verse 9 and 10 that the father dwells in me and he does the works. He spoke to them about the spirit of God dwelling inside of him that makes him a son. He is speaking, speaking to you now that you also become a son. You will be in the father's house or you become the father's house. Say amen. He's speaking about the same thing. So he's teaching something consistent. I will pray the Father when I rise from the dead. When he says, I will go. And if I, when I come again, I will take you to myself. So that where I am, where he is, is a son. Where will you be? You'll be a son also. I will be a son. The Spirit will dwell in you also. If the Spirit dwells in you also, you can act also. That's what he's saying. So I will pray the Father, he shall give you, or the price of my resurrection is the Father giving you the Spirit. The Father giving you the Spirit, it will match with your nature, or the giving of the Spirit is a new birth, which is a new nature within you. Say, so I have the new nature within me. I have the Spirit of God within me. I don't need to feel anything. I need to know what I have. Hallelujah. Verse 20 of that chapter 14. See what it says in verse 20. Ah, uh, glory to God. Okay, look at verse 17. Look at verse 17 first. Look at verse 17 first. Look at verse 17 first. Even the Spirit of truth, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comfort that, that is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Why can't the world receive? Because the world also does not believe. Because when he was speaking to them, he was speaking about the reality that will be. And they believed on him. The reality that will be when they believe, and by believing they receive. So he says, which the world cannot receive, because he sees him, not in and knows him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you. And it shall be where? In you. The word in, theologians agree, has no better explanation than in. It is so deep that in is the best way you can explain in. In simply means a margin of natures. So one of the best ways they've tried to explain, because they still felt when they said that united with God, that they, they still felt they were watering it down. Paul's in is difficult to express. And Jesus is in. So in simply means one with another. One with another. In. It says even the spirit of reality, which reality? The reality of my resurrection. That spirit, even the spirit of that reality, that spirit that you have received. So, the new birth is the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb is not proof he rose. The indwelling of the spirit within you is proof that Jesus rose. That's so important. I know we thought back then that the empty tomb, any tomb can be empty. But it's not the emptiness, it's the infilling. The tomb is empty because you are filled with what the tomb once contained. Glory to God. That which came out of spiritual death, that which struck principalities and powers down, dwells in you now as one with your nature. Glory to God. That's what he's saying. The spirit of that reality is in you now. Whatever that reality is, the spirit within you can enable you to do. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 20 now. After everything Jesus said, look at what Jesus said in verse 20. And in that day, which day is he talking about? The day of that reality. The day that I rise from the dead, when the spirit becomes available. In chapter 7, he has told you, this speaking of the spirit, which day that believe on him should receive. But that spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified or risen from the dead. So he's saying, the resurrection of Jesus signals the giving of that spirit. If he is risen from the dead, that spirit is given. If the spirit is given, you are cleansed. If you are cleansed, you have a new heart. If you have a new heart, you are a son of God. Are you following? He now says, in that day, when this becomes a reality, you shall know, oh, glory to God, that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The word no dear means you will gradually come to realize so, the prayers of Paul stem from that verse of scripture. 
you will gradually come to realize. It means the realization is not instantaneous. It's not once. It's a gradual process. You will gradually come to realize. What will you realize? What is the summary of he has blessed you with all spiritual blessing in heavenlies in Christ? What that reality means that he has made you accepted in the beloved. He has abandoned towards you in all wisdom and prudence. In him you have redemption that is the forgiveness of sins. He has sealed you with the spirit. The earnest of the redemption of the possession. What is that reality? It is that he is in the Father and you are in him and he is in you. Hallelujah. He is speaking about an inseparable union and it's called the indwelling of the spirit. Look at Romans chapter 8. Whoa, my time is fast spent. Romans chapter 8, glory to God. Romans 8. Hallelujah. Pastor will share some more things with us along that line tomorrow. When you stand before an unbeliever, you are the river carrier. You are the life giver. You are the one that carries salvation. You are the one that can remit their sins or the message upon your lips can remit their sins or release their sins. It means you carry the gospel, the key to the kingdom is within your mouth. And you have the spirit to back it up. The reality that Jesus is risen is not just in the message, it's in you. That new nature is the reality that Jesus is written. So when you stand, you stand with boldness. You are a true witness, not an eyewitness. You are a witness by revelation of what God has done. So when you go to preach the gospel, if Christ is a healer, then you are a healer. Do you understand? If Christ knows supernaturally, because the nature that made him that way is in you now. So you walk in the Kelo Sombra Dakar, a Suzo Broste, Fredila Gashte, Leosa Frodigante, Ligunso Suruka Teligadishte, like a mighty flowing stream whose boundaries cannot be contained. The life of God within you will come to the surface. It will overwhelm your senses. It will blow out and bless many lives. So allow, let go of the limitations of the mind that tell you, I need to prepare for you are prepared. He is your preparation. He is your confidence. As you stand there for confidence, knowing I have a river that abides in me forever, that same river will flow out as it quench your test and you are permanently refreshed. So we leave comfort and quench the test of many others. I will bring about the attention of men to the Father God. Glory to God. So there is a standing in the consciousness and awareness that he will never live nor forsake because Jesus said, the spirit that he may abide with you forever ever forever doesn't mean duration forever means the nature it means your nature and the nature of god are one that's what it means that's what forever means he's not speaking english he's speaking spiritual reality hallelujah speaking spiritual reality so romans 8 now glory to god oh glory verse 9 so the epistles are an explanation of the things Jesus tried to teach. Let me put, take a pause. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 16, I have yet many things to say unto you. I have yet many things to say unto you. But you cannot bear them now. That's after speaking in chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. And Jesus says there are many things. And if you check the Greek word, many things, the bulk of what I want to say, I have not said. That's what he was saying. So you can't take the teachings in chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter and, and assume you have learned everything. You have, that's a fraction of what he wants to say. To show us it was a fraction, in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says Jesus had a 40-day Bible seminar with disciples. I want you to imagine because if pastor says, come for seven days teaching, some of us will not come. It's not just teaching. It's not just teaching. Ah, teaching is our life. Understanding is how we work on the things of God. You see, ah, but if I just say that seven days prayer conquering your enemy, oh my goodness. You see people from outside start coming. Just put sign at the outside, slay your Goliath. That's all. You see everybody, even Muslim will come. Why? Because they are consciousness that of the enemy. We are conscious of sonship. We are conscious of sonship. That's what we have. So we focus on studying the scriptures diligently, knowing this is a record. You see, when you go to, when you go through the four gospels, it's our biography. 
Have you looked at family scriptures before? You go to the epistles, you look and you see yourself. See how I look like. You see the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. You see yourself face to face. We behold as in a mirror. There's a reflection back. What we see is who we are. It has nothing to do with how we feel. It's who we are. Do you understand? So when Jesus said, I have yet many things to see unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you. That guidance is the indwelling of the spirit. Is that you have to have the nature before you can perceive the reality. So the indwelling of the spirit is for perceiving the reality of our sonship. We are sons. How do we perceive? I'll pray. I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, to give unto you spiritual wisdom. And what? Revelation in the knowledge of it. Let me say this. Everyone we call a spiritual diant in the history of the church, in what we call major revivals, the revivals came about not by God doing something new, but by men seeing something new. The men saw what was always there that was veiled from them. When they saw it, they arose. Their consciousness woke up to the supply, the limitless supply of God's ability within them, and they did exploits. That's what happened. It wasn't God suddenly just tearing something. Yes, God can awaken us per season to certain realities. He can. But the same way, when we awaken those realities, that's when we begin to walk in those things. So, it is not God giving you something fresh. It is you comprehending afresh what has always been. That's what happens. What has always been. Glory to God. What has always been. So, look at that Romans 8 now. Where are we? I want to see if you are following. Where are we? Which verse are we in? Verse. Thank you. But you are not in the flesh. Is that an absolute statement or not? Say, I'm not in the flesh. Now, let me say this. In the flesh doesn't mean in the physical body. In the flesh is a spiritual state. It means to be in sin. It means to be outside of Christ. So, don't let the word throw you. The word flesh there doesn't mean your physical body. Everybody has a physical body. The word flesh there means that in a state of sin. It means to have the unrenewed nature. That's what it's talking about. Say, but you are not in that state any longer. It says, it says, if it is true, which is so, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Say, the Spirit of God dwells in me. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Can you say that? He is none of his. And if Christ be in you, and whenever you see the word if, and the word um, um, if so be here, they are not conditional statements. The one if in the original Greek is also the word since. So if he says, and if Christ be in you, it is also, and since Christ be in you. Hallelujah. It, it, this has confused many people. The one if and since means since Christ be in you, the body is there because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Hallelujah. Go back to that verse 9 again. I want to show you something. Remember what Ezekiel said. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, you shall be clean. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a new heart. Isn't it? I will put my spirit within you. So the clean water, the new heart, my spirit, they are all the same. Jesus said, the water I will give you is what? Living water. What's living water? He spoke of the spirit. Which they that believe in him should what? Receive. Then Ezekiel, that same Ezekiel chapter 6 verse 27 now says that, I will take you to the land. This is the land. This is the land. Look at verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. That's a land. But you are where? In the spirit. That's a land. Where, where are you now? Where are you now? That's a land. You have to understand Ezekiel's land though. Ezekiel's land is not in battle. <laughs> the spirit is God's real estate. You carry real estate on your inside. Hallelujah. You carry, see I carry real estate. The indwelling of God's spirit. Is God's real estate on my inside. That's what it means. So you are in a land. Where's that land? In the spirit. So from the day you receive the new body indwelling, your new address is the spirit. Say, I'm in the spirit. I'm always in the spirit. Now, let me say it another way. Because you get it because of tomorrow's meeting. You know, we say, I want to get in the spirit. How many of you know? I've said that before. Someone says, is this scriptural? It is, though. It depends on what you mean. But here's what we think. You are in the spirit if you are in Christ. 
Because having the spirit indwelling has changed your address. You want me to show you? Colossians 1, verse 12. Colossians 1, verse 12. So you understand how to function. Colossians 1, verse 12. Hallelujah. This Colossians 1 from verse 9 is a prayer that complements the prayer I prayed in Ephesians 1. And in the epistles of Paul, how do you know the churches that are the most mature? You see the kind of prayer I pray for them. The prayer I pray for the church in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 16 to 23. The one he prayed for the same church in Ephesus in chapter 3, verse 14 to 20. You see the prayer? Now in Colos Colosse, the church at Colosse, there was a prayer I also prayed for them from verse 9. That I will be free with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So that they may walk worthy of the Lord in all that's pleasing, bring fruit in every good work, increasing knowledge of God, strengthening with all might according to his glorious power. So here's where it's really going. Until they get to that place in their comprehension where they are giving thanks to the Father. Oh, sorry, you have come here. Look, go back to that verse 12. We can't open every scripture tonight. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto who? You give thanks to the Father when you are conscious is your Father. The consciousness is in the previous prayers. That's how you arrive at the consciousness. So you have the spirit. The people he's talking to have the spirit. That they have the spirit doesn't mean they know what it means. To have the spirit is to call God Father. We're going to come back to Romans. Because Romans now says that you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit that places you as a son. Whereby we cry what? Habba Father. He's saying the same thing. He's just saying the same thing in a different way. All the epistles of Paul are more like the same. The, are you following? They are more like the same. So here he now says, Give me thanks to the Father who has made us or qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. How were you qualified? By giving you his spirit. His spirit is a new nature, is a new birth, is clean water that has cleansed you from all filthiness. Verse 13. Who has delivered us from the... The word power is what? Authority. Authority. Authority of darkness and has what? Translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. The beauty of reading the scripture is this. When, before you got saved, you were here. Some of you were still were here in the bottom. After you got saved, guess where you still are? In the bottom. So which part of you was translated? Your physical body or your spirit? How were you translated? You received his spirit. So if you were translated by his spirit... Are you not in a new land? Which land are you in now? The kingdom of his dear son. Are you seeing it now? So Ezekiel's land is the kingdom of his dear son. Hallelujah. Paul says the kingdom of his what? Dear son. But notice the giving of the spirit, which is translating from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Look at how he says the same thing in verse 14. They are not different realities. They are the easy explanation. It's going. It's going. It's just explanation. Look at verse 14. In whom we now have what? Redemption. What is deliverance from the authority of darkness? Redemption. What is translated into the kingdom of the dead son? Redemption. What does that redemption mean? The giving of the spirit is the forgiveness of your sins. They are not separate realities. The word and is an explanation of what has taken place. How do we know? Ezekiel said, when I sprinkle clean water upon you, I will wash you from your idols. What is idols? That's sin. That's Ezekiel's language for freeing you from the bondage of sin, which is the authority of the kingdom of darkness. So in receiving the spirit, the new birth simply means you have what? Forgiveness of sins. So the spirit you received, how did he cleanse you? By so the nature of a believer is the nature of God now. Hallelujah. I say I'm God's real estate. I'm that land that the Bible speaks of. The Bible says that for Abraham look for a city whose builder and maker is God. You are that city today. You are the city Abraham looked for. Who's be Abraham, he was in Canaan. Abraham got to Canaan and continued moving. He was in Canaan. He's a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. And when we flow tomorrow evening, Holy Ghost, you are going to see some things along that line. You know, Psalm 48, we open up to you in the prayer. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. That's how King James says it. The word beautiful there, the word for situation means beautiful, el beautifully elevated. The word situation is elevation. 
it's talking about the spiritual blessing we have in the heavenlies. The city of God is a new creation. Hallelujah. And that's where God's greatness is seen. In that place, God's holiness is a mountain. <laughs> God's holiness is a mountain that is impenetrable. Why? Because his holiness is now your holiness. Your holiness is not separate from his own. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It, that is that city that Abraham looked forward to. Whose builder, what? Maker is God. How do you know the maker is God? Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water. I will take, I will sprinkle, I will put it. It is the activity of God. The ingredient of the spirit is the activity of God in man. The spirit of upon is the activity of men in God. That's what, I'm just trying to use a summary to explain it. The, in, the, the, the spirit upon is the activity of who? Of men. Where? In God. The indwelling is the aspirity of God in man. So one comes for the other. It's because you have received living water that you can give living water. Hallelujah. So in him we have redemption. That is what? The forgiveness of sins. What's forgiveness of sins? The indwelling of the spirit. One of the most difficult truths for the body to seem to accept is the fact that because when I got saved in the 80s, we didn't have, I wasn't taught those things when we first got saved. Salvation was the most important thing. After that, some teachings and basic things, how to just live a holy lifestyle, which is good. But you see, we discover from the scriptures that the spirit of God is given to sinners. And that's how they become saints. Should I say that that way? <laughs> you, look, <laughs> you look on your face. The spirit of God is given to who? Sinners. That's how sinners become saints. The spirit of God is not given to believers. It's given to sinners. It is when the sinner receives the spirit that he becomes what? A saint. I will put sprinkle clean water. I will put my spirit. It's the activity of God in men. Jesus said, if you test, come unto me. How do you come? Everyone that believes you come. This picky of the spirit, which they that believe should receive. Those who believe have believed unto salvation. What's their salvation? The giving of the Spirit. Hallelujah. So they are not two separate experiences. One experience is just for that explain the indwelling of the Spirit. Go back to Romans chapter 8. Go some random. Are you getting something tonight? I need you to get this understanding for the things we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, for the things we're going to get to tomorrow. Okay. One of the things I do is that I go around local assemblies because I've discovered that. Um, God gave us ministers that have operations. Okay? They have operations of the Spirit. And when they come to our local assemblies, they come with the operations of the Spirit. We get blessed. But here's the challenge. God wants every local assembly to have those operations. Or, so that as pastor said, you are equipped or furnished for the work of the ministry. So the operations of God within you should come alive. But when you are taught how to work in those operations, the whole assembly is edified. The whole assembly is edified. So one of the things I do is I go to assemblies and teach the operations. I teach how you can work in it, how everyone can work in it. Of course, there are some things that you are not able to work in the full measure. But somebody stands for you and demonstrates. And I want to show you because when people demonstrate the things of the spirit, they don't give you the spirit. They are waking you to the spirit you have within you. No man can give you the spirit. When they lay hands, impartation is awakening faculties already within you. That's what ministers do. So I teach how there is continuity. Not that when a minister steps out, the operation leaves also. No. There should be continuity. In my assembly, we have people who work in healing. We have people who stand, who function in interpretation. We have people who stand, who function in Lord's generation. Because that's the plan of God for the whole assembly. So we have meetings where we have healing meetings and we, are, we call one or, if one or two people who are constantly used along that line because that's the plan of God for a local assembly. This person is used of God in healing. This person is used in this area. We come to an assembly, we should come to an assembly and say that, sir, where are those who interpret? Where is the interpreter of this assembly? Where are the interpreter? They should be. Of course, the pastor primarily stands in our office to stand in the office of tongues and interpretation. But there should be people who have been raised and developed, who are given to prophets, who are given to interpretation, just by teaching. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Because you are meant to do the work of the ministry. Work of ministry is not pastor's work. It is your work. Pastor furnishes you, equips you. You do the work of ministry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You do the work of ministry. Say, I do the work of ministry. I have the spirit of God dwelling on my inside. It's time to awaken to the realities of that spirit. Romans chapter 8. Oh, two years. I waited on you for two years. To stop mixing up affairs of the secular world with the things of ministry. For you have said, after I try and I succeed in secular affairs, I will give myself more to the ministry, and the ministry languishes. And the ministry is here to thrive and to prosper. But here now, an admonition, an instruction, and a clear warning. The more you stay, the more you hold back, the less you'll be given to the things of the ministry. For that which is within you, we fade seemingly. Not because it goes away, but because your attention is drawn by other things. So awaken now to that which I've called you to do and begin. And that which starts as a trickle will still become a flowing river that will bless. And other things that you sought out will fall into place. I'm speaking to someone who's a minister here. I hope you, how many of you understood what I just said? Okay, so I don't know who you are, but as we go on tonight, just before we close up, you can come up and I'll just pray with you. But the warning of God is that we have stepped over into a new decade. You don't relegate your assignments till later. You don't say, when I'm more comfortable, I will do it. You start doing it when you know about it. You don't have as much time as you think. And the reality of what he has asked you to do will not come into full expression as long as you keep procrastinating. So the Spirit of God is Siandro Shure Tia Caste, Ezuzumbro Vlediana Kiste, Eli Grunsa Frestele Caste Nisto, Sobradante Elegli Eleshi Procusta, for your conscience being tender over time as you keep violating and violating it, the time is coming. It will become hardened. And a place of prayer, answers will no longer come. Not because I refuse to allow answers to come, but because your conscience has become hardened through disobedience. So do not allow your heart to become hardened through disobedience. Follow the witness of the Spirit. For the witness of the Spirit is a father talking to his son. Guiding his son and saying, this is the way to go. Walk in it. Do not step back. And every other thing that you desire will fall into place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Like I said, I'm not going to call you out now. But after, just, just go ahead and see me. Romans chapter 8. It is given to men to pray for provisions. And in waiting for provisions, you don't consider the option and say, let me go and borrow. <laughs> for it will meet your need and surpass it. It will come true for you. So stand your ground and know it's a fight of faith. Victory is already yours. It's not coming. It's already with you. Give praise to him and thank him. And all you need will come and you will not need to borrow. Let's give him praise tonight. Let's give him praise tonight. And you don't need to borrow. You will not need to borrow. Oh, you know. Oh, sir. Eso nandro. Ole freste le kiste. Eso no. Enreki. Reconcile your mind with the reality of his love afresh. Reconcile your mind, knowing no good thing can be withheld from you. Reconcile your mind and know God is for you. Nothing can be against you. Reconcile your mind. And as you embrace more the revelation of his love, you will find all things are ready to end. Even that which seemed to be far away will be brought near that you can lay hold and walk in the blessing of it. You can lay hold and walk in the blessing of it. Hallelujah. You, you have um, like, like a migraine at this left side of your head towards the back. You are healed now in the name of Jesus. 
you're healed and in the name of Jesus. And someone you have a limp that has to do with a pain towards the lower part of your back also. You're healed now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to call out a line shortly. And has refused to go for so long. Right now you are healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's round up. Romans of time. Are you there? Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him, but if the spirit of him, so let's change it in light of what we are, but since the spirit of him, are you there? That raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. See that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. That victory, that conquest, dwells in me now. It says, but the, if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall what? Quicken your mortal body. Who is he? The spirit that raised from the dead. That's the spirit of God that dwells in you now. Okay? Uh, verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received one, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then hears, heirs of God, and join ears with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also what? Glorified together. See, I may join him with Christ Jesus. The spirit that raised him, raised me also. I have his victory. I have his conquest. The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. Is that shout on your inside? Is that shout on your inside? Is that shout on your inside tonight? Is that shout on your inside tonight? The shout of that victory is on my inside tonight. Glory to God. Since the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dwells in you. So that spirit dwells in me. The activity of that spirit is in me tonight. That shout is in me tonight. That laughter is in me tonight. That rejoices in me tonight. <laughs> Glory to God. If the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that spirit dwells in you. The reality of that spirit dwells in you. You are the proof that Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why we laugh all the time. That's why we shout all the time. That's why we rejoice all the time. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the challenge. We thank you. Thank you for your word and the life that we have received. Thank you for the understanding that is ours to enjoy. Thank you for the indwelling and the spirit of power. We walk in the reality of these things. Your power is made manifest. The understanding of men are open up. Men are able to walk without restrictions. Men are able to walk in the reality of the abundance of your blessing. Thank you for your power made manifest for every man and every woman to walk in. These are the days that you spoke of. These are the days that you spoke of. The days of your power. In the days of your power, your people are willing. In the days of your power, your people are willing. We are willing, Father, to walk in all that you have shown us in your word. By your spirit, we give expression. By your spirit, we walk in the realities of who we are and what we have. Yeah, your name is exalted and glorified forever. Your name is exalted and glorified forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I mentioned some ailments earlier. You have any ailments? Can you just come to the front quickly? Quickly, quickly. You have any ailments? Can you just come to the front quickly? I will worship you forever, love be forever because this God is too good. I will worship you forever, love be forever. I will worship you forever, love you forever, because this God is too good. Oh. I will worship you. I 